Um, okay, so we're ready for our first speaker. Um, we're allowed to call him George, because it's a little difficult. So this is George Gorgay, and we are very pleased that he was able to uh, accept our invitation. So, George, please. Uh, so especially uh, given the, the, the great uh, company I'm talking with today, you know, the Sandra Waxman and uh, Sue Carey and uh, the poster FRDs. And um, uh, I'm, I'm wearing an unusual amount of badges. The reason is, I need to say this, this is that I'm coming from the Central European University. Some of you may have heard the kind of uh, uh, like Putin, uh, Trump type of uh, attack that our university is going through and may be thrown out of the country. It's a private American university in Budapest. And uh, uh, this is to protest against this shameful uh, acts. Uh, and the, the other reason I'm here, apart from this, is to introduce Sandra Stoke, because I think what I'm going to say will be a very good kind of lead up, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to her quite related interests. So, oh yeah, as to this title, a lot of people work on brain here, and maybe they already are put off by this title, but I just want to make it more just point out that there is an ambiguity in this title. The claim is not only that it is possible to uh, communicate and read communicative mind without language, but also by preverbal infants who do not have language. So this is all about preverbal infant communicative abilities. Uh, so, what I call the, um, the pragmatic sense is, uh, is the human's evolved uh, uh, capacity for verbal and nonverbal forms of ostensive communication. And this is really kind of our species unique communicative instinct for a, 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 a large uh, variety of epistemic cooperation where we are enabled uh, uh, to exchange and transmit a broad range of relevant information uh, in, uh, across a variety of contexts. And the way human communication can do that is that it is very complex. And it is complex in a way that, well, I'll uh, call here a mixed communicative system because it has evolved really two basic kinds of mechanisms for information transfer. One is code-based conventional symbols like uh, linguistic mapping devices, like uh, spoken words, uh, together with their combinatorial syntactic apparatus, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, 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 conventional gestures, uh, and these together encode a, 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 a flexibly variety of uh, uh, info relevant information and can also be used to uh, uh, decode uh, these uh, informations. I should mention here that uh, all known uh, forms of evolved animal communication, the non-human animals communication, exclusively rely on, on code-based uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, which are very few, typically in number, very domain-specific. Their mapping to meaning is pre-specified and innately transmitted, uh, like vervet monkey calls, and uh, uh, I'm not going to give you many examples, so I, uh, I can get on. Uh, the, uh, and in, in humans, the uh, decoding of the conventional uh, words and gestures allows, especially in verbal communication, to, uh, to recover the literal or sentence meaning of a verbal utterance used in, uh, uh, in a sentence or uh, in a, a given context. 
However, the other and absolutely human specific, to, as far as you know, the mechanism is an inference based mechanism of uh, uh, context sensitive pragmatic inferences of communicative mind reading, which allows uh, 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 to go beyond uh, uh, the literal meaning of sentences to what, uh, uh, since Grice's insight and current day pragmatic theories like relevant theory proposed, is uh, 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 recovering the intended meaning or the speaker's meaning, which is the real aim of a communicative, uh, even in verbal communication, to, uh, to use uh, 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 code-based symbols. Lit uh, so there are these two mechanisms, but I want to say a little bit about their relation to each other and actually uh, just, just point at three arguments to suggest that uh, there is a primacy of the pragmatic inferential component uh, uh, in the human adaptation for co uh, ostensive communication. And the first argument, and I really will just point at these arguments, these are uh, coming from uh, uh, communication theory, pragmatics and linguistics, uh, that uh, um, uh, there, has, there is a, a, a very convincing large amount of work showing that the uh, code-based linguistic mechanisms are not sufficient to explain comprehension, especially to recovery of the intended meaning in context uh, of communication uh, and uh, the, why they may be used to, recover, to, to uh, decode the literal meaning that is only an input to the further context sensitive inferences that uh, are necessary to uh, uh, identify inferentially the speaker's intended meaning. Uh, there is also uh, an argument one can make, one can make a paradox kind of out of it, of word learning, how the meaning of words are acquired, especially if uh, a code-based uh, approach would suggest that one needs a code to understand a communicative uh, meaning. Uh, so they are co by, uh, transmitted by codes. However, since these codes and uh, the, 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 the mapping between code and, and concepts and meanings is, is uh, conventional, they must be acquired, they are not innate. And so one needs to understand communication in order to acquire the code of language. So in particular, if one assumes that children acquire the meanings of words by understanding what the speaker intends to refer to when using them, then the question arises as how they can understand what the speaker intends to refer to without knowing what the words mean. And that again, uh, uh, the, the kind of solution probably to this paradox is that we have evolved a capacity to recognize actions as ostensive communicative actions with this particular dedicated function uh, which are uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which indicate and serve to manifest the communicator's communicative intentions to transfer relevant and new information uh, to the interlocutor. Uh, uh, so um, the hypothesis is, is that humans under specific conditions and infants can infer that a given action is really intended to be uh, serving a communicative function uh, and that the communicator intends to communicate by means of this action. So that suggests that the solution, the paradox is that young learners language learners must rely on context-based pragmatic inferences in the first place uh, to infer and acquire the conventional meanings encoded by novel words from the way competent speakers use them uh, in various community contexts to transmit uh, their intended uh, uh, informative 
meanings. The third argument is kind of related, but it it, it can be made for adults and for, baby, uh, for infants, is that humans are extremely well adapted to engage in nonverbal forms of ostensive communication. So uh, we have uh, evolved a sophisticated ability to ostensibly communicate our informative intentions to an addressee by relying on purely nonverbal means of ostensive action, communicative action manifestations. And this can be done without the necessity to then employ any code-based meanings. And there are two related theories around that have uh, been exploring this claim. One is the, uh, well, it's pragmatics and, and especially uh, post gricean relevant, uh, pragmatic approaches like Sperber and Wilson's relevance theory of ostensive communication. And the other is what uh, uh, we call natural pedagogy theory, which is a special application of ostensive communication to transmit uh, cultural generic uh, knowledge very early on. And, uh, and uh, uh, Gergo Chibra and myself have been spending uh, uh, quite some years now to, uh, to uh, you know, gather evidence for, for that uh, position. Both of these theories claim that uh, there is early evolved capacity for ostensive inferential communication, even without and before language acquisition. Okay. So the, how do we recognize ostensive communicative acts? Uh, and uh, the claim is that we have evolved sensitivity to certain special behavior signals that have become dedicated uh, 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 devices to manifest somebody's uh, uh, communicators, uh, to, uh, to, to recognize ostensive communicative interactions, and they induce the, at, uh, uh, the attribution of what I will call communicative agency. And, there will be later to connect up with Sue's work also this question whether I will be claiming for distinction between two adaptations, one for intentional agency, which is kind of uh, instrumental, goal-directed, intentional agency, versus communicative agency, where the instrument agency is doing actions to change the, physically change the world, according to his goals, while communicative agents engage in behavior that uh, change the other's mental states, like uh, dispositions, beliefs, desires. Um, so communicative intentions can be attributed by certain signals of, co of ostensive communication, trigger the attribution of communicative intentions, which, I which are intentions to demonstrate an intended referent about which the agent wants to convey new and relevant information uh, for the recipient to infer. Now, this, the identification of the intended referent and the, the content of the informative intention, the, the new and relevant information about the referent is what referred to as the informative intentions, referential and informative intentions, which are uh, kind of the communicative intentions and tail that you have an intention to transmit informative content about a referent. Okay. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so what are these specialized ostensive behavior signals uh, that induce recognition of ostensive communication? And I, I, I have three types here. Uh, uh, um, our work has been uh, in nature pedagogy theory concentrated on nonverbal uh, signals, uh, specialized behavior signals that the third one here, that, uh, such as, and the claim were for three such uh, cues of ostensive communication, establishing eye contact, being addressed by mother ease, 
and uh, being ad engaged in turn-taking contingent reactivity at a distance. And uh, uh, in the meantime, a uh, uh, wonderful set of studies by uh, uh, Chris Onishi uh, and uh, 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 Volumanos have, uh, have shown that which, not surprisingly, the, the innate sensitivity of human speech and speech sounds and novel words is itself sufficient to uh, indicate the ostensive communicative intention and lead to the pragmatic inferences, uh, I suggest. And then there are nonverbal, like deictic gestures of reference that allows a referential interpretation of the act, such as pointing or showing up. Uh, and uh, lastly, I should mention that, in fact, any behavior can be, when, when presented in an ostensive addressing context, uh, uh, and sometimes marked by a special motor transformation of exaggeration, uh, uh, schematization, uh, uh, so they're not delivered by their most efficient functional manner, is a signal these transformations, which ostensive marking, uh, is actually suggests that, that this behavior is now used for a communicative purpose. So it's different to hammer a nail in and show somebody how to hammer a nail in and, and these transformations which are not sub-efficient but signal the communicative intent. So really uh, all of this is available to recognize communication. And to get to the meat of my talk, I would like to just make the point that according to this approach, recognizing ostens ostensive communication induces two types of pragmatic inferences. First, when you, uh, one knows that one is being communicated to, one wants to know what about. So one wants to identify the referent, disambiguate the referent, the intended referent of the other. And uh, there are expectation of behavior signals coming that will allow me to do that. And uh, however, that's not the end of the story because I can identify what the other is uh, attending to, for example, but I also want to know or develop an expectation because of recognizing ostensive communication, communicative intent, that uh, now I am expecting even more information that will allow me to figure out the new and relevant information that is relevant for me that the other is offering about the intended reference. So there is reference identification and the inference to the content of the new and relevant information. Um, okay, so uh, this, this is the three cues that we have proposed uh, and I will uh, signal very briefly the first kind of inference, the kind of evidence we have, the first kind of inference, which is that os there are ostensive cues induce an expectation for further cues of referential nature that are referential signals that allows the ba baby to identify what the uh, communication will be about. And uh, these referential cues, like gaze shift, pointing uh, have the communicative function of demonstrative reference. Uh, this is a well-known study by uh, uh, Senju and Chibra. Uh, it's an eye tracker based study which simply shows that six months old uh, are ready to follow the gaze which is uh, as a referential cue to the object uh, that the other is kind of pointing out. But Unlike in animal communication, when there is following of gaze direction often to share the, in, uh, the attentional focus of a conspecific. However, in humans, it seems that this response has been conditionalized to some degree at least on first having been addressed. So the ostens, it, it, it only takes place if first you have been addressed with ostensive communication 
So eye contact and mother ease have been shown to, uh, to need to precede the gaze shift to be followed to the referent. So this looks, I'll show the, uh, the other directed speech example. Hello. That's just an attention getter. In the, and you can see that we can follow whether after this mother is hello, babies follow to the six months or to the fixated object or not. And compare it. Hello. To this adult directed speech. And we get a very similar kind of, these are three indices, the first looks, frequency of looks to the two sides, uh, and duration of time spent on the two sides. All of them clearly show that the infant directed speech uh, case, infant significantly, these are different schools, uh, which way you look. So they follow uh, the gaze, but only if it has been preceded by a direct eye contact or by a mother is, uh, and uh, not without those. Now, um, okay, so my focus will be on the, on the third type of cue and our work on, on turn-taking contingent reactivity. Uh, and this is the cue which has been claimed to play this function. It has been, there was some controversy, there is some controversy, partly uh, uh, for Sue's always contrast, con constructively critical uh, 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 attention to our work. Uh, but basically, uh, there is, the point is that why for the other two cues, there is evidence, I'm not going to talk about in lack of time, that not only referent identification is induced by the ostensive cues, but there are further, uh, well, the other type of inference for, for what's the new and re relevant information uh, uh, about, for example, showing new artifacts, what they are for, whether the kind, uh, learning about a kind of artifact can be driven by that. We have evidence on a number of, from a number of studies for the other two cues, but we only have evidence up till now for the gaze following uh, when it comes to, so the first kind of uh, referential inference and what I want to do is first of all describe that nature of that evidence and then go on to some studies that, that uh, show that the uh, inference of new and relevant information can be also induced by this abstract behavior pattern of uh, distal interaction, okay? So this, these studies have a lo long history. The first study was uh, done by Movelan and Watson, and uh, then uh, 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 Susie Johnson, uh, 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 Virginia Slaughter, and Sue Carey has, uh, has uh, developed further that paradigm, and uh, both of them showed that the baby contingent reactions contingently influencing a robot's non-human, uh, featuring non-human uh, entities uh, re uh, uh, reactivity will induce a, f uh, a gaze following of an orientation change towards an object. And uh, this is just a, okay, this is just for historical reference. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is from the original study of John Watson and it shows how fast infants, how re reactive infants are of, of the contingent uh, the causal contingency at the distance that they can exert on uh, an unknown uh, object. So on the right side you see this, this, this robot, this is before computer times, and uh, uh, the baby's vocalizations are the response, and somebody pushes the button and then the robot is vocalizing back. And
bingo. So uh, there are a number of interesting things about this. Uh, one is that uh, John's work showed that this con contingency also evokes smiling and cooing, which are social responses. So it suggests that even if it's not a human person, this, the contingent, high degree of contingent uh, control over its behavior is, is kind of interpreted as a, in, a, in the social domain. And uh, so um, uh, his, the idea then that this was taken up by uh, many other uh, suggests that this is, this suggests that the child that attributes social intentional agency at least to this robot is a ref referential interpretation of distal actions which implies perception. Per oh yeah, because then I forgot to say that after this, the, the, uh, there are two objects on the side and this robot just turns towards one of them. And the baby is, when uh, this contingent reactivity was presented, they follow the gaze. In a yoke control design, when the same amount of exactly the same amount of vocalizations of by the robot randomly uh, related to the baby's behavior, they do not follow the gaze. Here is a, a, a kind of a more uh, modern day uh, computer-based replication or, or attempt to look at this uh, with Erno Teglash. And uh, uh, here uh, the baby has uh, in his sock a, a, a movement sensor and that can register online the kicking of behavior of the baby uh, and the movements of that thingy that the baby sees there is, uh, is controlled by the baby's kicking. Okay? And we have two conditions and then the two, after the training phase, the two objects revealed and uh, there's an orientation towards one or the other. And we watch with an eye tracker whether the baby has followed or not, and indeed, in, if in the contingent case, uh, the uh, baby controls the movements of the object, they are significantly following uh, the orientation to the object. Here is, that was 12 months. This is a, 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 a totally automatized uh, kind of computer-based de design where uh, the baby sees these uh, 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 unfamiliar objects, and the middle one that you can see marked out the region of interest in the contingent version, when the, baby, the baby's response here is to fixate that object. When the baby fixates, it moves. Uh, the other ones move randomly. Uh, the baby then has to come out of the region and with a saccade and go back again in order to make it move again. So this is, and after some a training period, only these three remain, and then you get the turning response. And again, we could show these eight months olds that they follow to uh, the referent of uh, kind of uh, indicated by the orientation response, but only in the contingent reactive uh, condition. Now, there is a kind of a debate about the nature of the interpretation of these findings. And while uh, we were pushing for this strong, well, in a sense, stronger interpretation that the baby is actually assigning communicative agency to this object and interprets the, uh, the orientation to the target as not simply as a referential response of like seeing or attending to uh, uh, which is an, an intentional goal-directed agent, uh, reactive at a distance, could do, but actually showing. So this is the, 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 uh, the difference between two levels of interpretation, uh, uh, whether gaze here is, uh, uh, gaze to an object is uh, due to seeing, attending, or uh, in a goal-directed case like chasing, an object uh, which is, could you know, be uh, giving grants to assigning intentional agency, but not more intentional agents have this to referential focus, uh, 
versus showing or communicatively referring, which is the communicative case. And, uh, uh, well, so I will argue for the communicative case here in two ways. I will show some cases where you can kind of derive differential predictions from this theory. First of all, if it's an intentional agent's referential focus that is uh, being uh, followed because of salience or because I consider conspecific, I want to see what he is attending to. Fine, that's, uh, uh, we may well do that, uh, but uh, what kind of agents would be in question? Certainly a goal-directed agent who is, uh, has been observed chasing a prey satisfies all the self-propelledness, efficiency of goal-directed action, etc., and the distal perception of the goal object. So you would expect that if you show a goal-directed agent, and then after that the agent now shows a, 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 a orientation uh, towards one of two target objects, you should follow it on the ground of an uh, intention agency story. So we, we had this kind of a chasing pot set up. The baby familiarizes the thingy chasing that object. And after that, I don't have the uh, video, I just found this uh, this morning. Uh, after that, we put the agent again in the middle with two objects and it just turns towards one and babies do not follow this uh, 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 goal-directed but not communicative age. Here, this is, this is an interesting uh, new study where we shows that turn-taking contingency can induce, for example, agent individuation and that uh, let me just keep the explanation of why that is expected from communicative agents. Just show you what we do. So there are three turn taking interactions with variable responses on the side. Then the thingy goes back. Comes out on the other side, and it's not. Now I wonder what your first reaction is. Why it not, it's not reacting? I mean, yeah. Well, people say when I ask, it's my impression that some motivation that he, he got angry with you or he's bored or whatever, they changed his disposition towards you. Now we did the same thing now, but with no turn taking. So the, the little blue things does exactly the same thing, self propelled movement, variability and everything on one side and nothing on the other side, but there is no turn taking at all. There's just Oops, this, this, uh, uh, the, the duck is observing it, that's it. And now we reveal what's behind the, uh, the uh, and what we show is we reveal and there are either one or two objects behind. And it seems that the babies resolve this uh, kind of a unpleasant state of affairs that he was talking to me before here. And, and there's not, I'm just not replying here. It cannot be the same guy. There had to be another guy. My person, my partner is in there. And in fact, this relates importantly to, to uh, community. And we have other data and other type of studies. I cannot talk about it now, where it seems that communi communication uh, is actually a cue to individuate the recipient of the communication, because communication is typically pro-social, you know, they are giving relevant information and it induces a, a long-term expectation of mutual reciprocity. So if I lend you money, I better remember I lend it to you and not to Sue, and uh, you know, go and ask back the money from Sue. So it is very important to, 
know who remember whom you communicate. Now this this is a, a another uh, set of studies where we are showing these uh, highly contingent, one case imitative interactions between these two human shadow figures, or uh, and also temporarily contingent. Uh, uh, exchange of behaviors, but the behaviors are different. So in one case it's imitative, the other case it, it's the guy is always doing something else, but temporarily they are contingent. And what we were looking at is uh, pupil dilation while watching these scenes. And we know, well, pupil dilation is, you know, it, as you well know probably better than me, it can induce a, a, be induced by a whole lot of different factors. It certainly is, is well documented that processing load uh, is related to pupil dilation. And so this is what the babies watch. Or the adults. So the first, there is a guy does it first, the other does exactly the same afterwards. There are three types of movement, and they are always imitated in the imitative condition. Okay? In the uh, non-imitative condition, uh, well, you, you have the same C type of movement, but now they are complementary in terms of their uh, production. So the first does A, the other does another uh, uh, movement again and other movements, so it's always a different movement, but they are temporary, perfectly uh, contingent in the same way. Now, six months old, in looking, this is looking time, uh, kind of preliminary data, but uh, you can see that over the blocks, they, uh, and th what this shows is, uh, um, oh, it's looking time, so, so they, uh, continue to look more, uh, I mean, they, they start to look less, let's say, to the imitative contingency. So, so when there is variability, and that's the point I'm going to use, that there is variability in the exchange uh, uh, behavior signals that, it, that, that induces more, probably more uh, work, more, more uh, uh, processing of what that may be going on in six months old. And if you look at uh, now phasic pupil uh, dilation, you can see that over a long number of trials, uh, there is significantly mm, uh, more pupil dilation. Basically, if, you know, as soon as you figure out the difference on the third uh, task, uh, all over the trials. So again, suggesting more work possibly more processing load for the uh, variable contingency. Uh, we also have a, such a difference in a, uh, just very briefly, in a tonic pupil dilation context, which in autistics we just don't find. Autistics don't seem to uh, differentiate this. Uh, we also found the difference when they, whether they face each other or turn away from each other. So, so this social communicative kind of positioning is, is again induces this uh, pupil dilation. But now I want to go to the, uh, I call it flatfish. <laughs> it just got stuck because of you will see the object we are using and they look like flat fish. So, uh, uh, these are supposed to be just really unfamiliar uh, uh, objects. And the question is that the queue of turn-taking contingent exchange of now, of unfamiliar signal sequences. And here it will be important that now we have three vocal sequences imitated or, or, you know, reacted to by three vocal sequences. And what we vary is whether there is unpredictability or variability in this C, uh, in the two sequences, or whether they are just parroting each other. So they are perfectly identical. Uh, and this is related to a kind of an information theoretic 
uh, idea that uh, in order for new and relevant information, which has kind of propositional content and, and, and it can be many, many different types of information, you need a, 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 you need a, a code system which has to have uh, unpredictability in it, because without unpredictability, as uh, since Shannon, we know very well that uh, no information can get through the channel. So, uh, if there is an actual uh, hypothesis of, of what the, that, that here uh, a, a new informational content will be transmitted, uh, that is, m that uh, is, I mean, I would here make a distinction between two types of ostensive communication. Ostensive communication can be like, even in animals, like uh, the mating dance or, or asking for food and giving, which, which, which are very, give a very particular uh, and uh, uh, unvariable message and which changes the dispositional state of the other like a, a distance call in proximity seeking uh, in, in even in human infant. However, if, if we want to say that ostensive communication is actually transmitting uh, a propositional information, new relevant information that the other doesn't know, it's relevant for him, but I know, then you need more, you need variability. And this is uh, in the uh, exchange, uh, which is related to, and Sandra will uh, know what I'm talking about, the, the, the signals uh, being considered as, as potential codes for meaning transmission in this case. So uh, even unfamiliar and non-speech signals can take up that uh, code-like categorization by infants if they are embedded in a turn-taking contingent. Uh, so, basically, the hypothesis we tested really has two points. In One, we say that uh, the infant has to have perceptual access to a relevant change of state, that he knows that another person has, for whom it, it will be relevant, doesn't know about because he went out like his ball has been put from one container to another, like in a so-called false belief task. And when he comes back for his ball, there was this other guy who stayed in and was present while this uh, took place. And if they engage in turn-taking uh, contingency, then if there is variability in that contingency, we tested whether the infant will think that He's correcting the false belief of the other, telling him where his ball has been put, so that uh, uh, without words, but inferring both the referent and the new information about the referent that has been transmitted. Okay? And uh, this is how it. Uh, I, I, I better just jump to the two. So this is a two by two. So. So I, either there is relevant change or there is no relevant change, uh, which is like a false belief and true belief condition. The ball either changes its location in the absence of the person or it just jumps out and goes back. So it's, it has not changed its position. Uh, if his goal is to go to his ball, he should be able to. And, uh, and uh, we varied whether the contingent interaction had variability in it or not. It's a two by two kind of thing. It looks like this with, uh, in melodic tones. This is the, so these are the flat fish and, and they uh, exchange these triplet of sounds. In this arrangement, the first sound uh, is always replicated by the other and the second two are varied. In fact, we did other type of variation, and as long as there is variation, it works. Uh, we wanted to get at some non-local uh, algebraic dependencies, but that's not it. Uh, this is the echo condition, they just, they just imitate uh, exactly what the other is doing. So 
So this is the familiarization, two groups of, uh, uh, these are 13 months old infants. And then the test is simply this. This is the first time they see this move, okay? And it orients towards one or the other. And in the variable tone case, uh, we get a significant gaze following. In the identical tone, we do not. Uh, we also did it with Morse signals, so it works that way too. Uh, so I'm not going to show that. Uh, then we were wondering that is it the, how, how important, is it the variability that's important, or it is also equally important that there are two agents, you know, which, which would be the, have different communicative roles. One, the information flows from the knowledgeable to the naive, uh, in, uh, if it is communication. Uh, and in fact, if you just present one guy and the same sequence of sounds, which had the variability structure of the same, you, get, you lose the effect. So it, there has to be uh, two agents uh, being involved in this variable turn-taking exchange. Okay, so now I am over time. I'm sorry? Well, I, this, I show this uh, kind of crucial study and then I'm done. This is one min, uh, two minutes. Okay? So this is the, this is the false belief informing study now. Here is, uh, in, this is the familiarization. The guy brings in his ball. They are kind of exchanging variable messages. I mean, babies understand this. I shouldn't comment on what you see, I suppose. He takes his ball there. It doesn't go out. And they see the ball come out and either go back or go to the other one. And, the, and he always goes to where the ball back. So he goes for his ball. This is the familiarization. And in the test, he comes again. He has, he's not talking now, so he just hides his ball and leaves. The, now the ball comes out and goes to the other container. And this, this yellow guy sees that or, yeah. He comes back, and before going for his ball, they exchange views, okay? And then he goes to either either one of the places, so either where the ball now is or where he left it. And, uh, and we have the rep identical repetition with the same, and uh, this is what we get, that uh, uh, in the variable message condition, uh, where there was a relevant change of state, so from container 8 it was put his ball was put to container B, uh, where it is now. So, in a variable exchange, infants expect the uh, approach of the container where the ball is, so, which is not where he left it. So this, uh, on the basis of where he left it, he, if he would predict that that's where he will look for it, then, uh, uh, this should be expected. Now you, you change that around, which suggests that uh, the uh, inf uh, informational state of the returning agent has been changed in a relevant way, so his false beliefs have been corrected by communication to have a true belief, and, hey, guy, now your ball is in this container, that's where you should go, and that's where he goes, that's where the baby expects him to go. Uh, when there was no variability in this exchange. So such a uh, kind of an episodic proposition information could not have been encoded through signals. Then we get the opposite. The guy is going back for the ball that, where he left it. His uh, belief state about where his ball is has not been re rewritten, that has not been changed because of this uh, 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 contingent interaction that had no unpredictability in it, so no information exchange could have passed through. 
And since, uh, okay, since I have been warned, I stop here, which is probably better for me because I have a few more things that come with the true belief condition, and I'll be happy to discuss that with people later, but it comes out in a bit puzzling way. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm looking for hands in the back of the room there. Hello. So in the beginning of the talk, you said that um, referential communication is, maybe I'm wrong, but you said it's required for learning uh, words, is that right? Um, but it, Word meanings. For word meanings, okay. Need to be acquired. Not um, that words are referential. So... There is evidence that, that speech sounds, human speech sounds an unfamiliar word from a, a voluminous non-initiation. Koba, you say this, and they know it's communication even though those were human subjects who had them. But words seem to already bring ostensive communicative okay. uh, meaning with them and referential meaning with them. Okay. I was just going to ask, because I think that there are some cultures where the babies are not directly um, uh, addressed and they still manage to learn their words. So do you have any thoughts on that? That, oh, okay. So. Most of our work with uh, uh, mother is uh, eye contact and even contingency activity was infant directed. So it was obviously, and I showed some examples that, that the infant uh, induced and was kind of, or the infant was looked into the eye. Now, one of the novelties I didn't point out about this experiment is this is third person. So you have a communicative interaction uh, in third person, and uh, uh, it seems that, that uh, children are not egocentric about it. So even in this case, as if they would know that if it is ostensive communication, there has to be a flow of relevant and new information, and, one, and I just have to figure out who is the knowledgeable and who is the naive one. And they are happy to make that inference, which is kind of nice. I mean, nice of them. I have a question about um, what, what you think the role of animacy is here, since some, in, particularly for some of your earlier experiments, you used um, artifacts. And um, it, it could possibly, another interpretation of some of your earlier data are that, is that, um, the, the subjects were um, operating on the world and interested in their ability to make a change on the world um, through eye movements and leg kicking and such, and that, it, that those findings weren't about communication per se, but they were about enacting change. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, at the beginning I referred to distinction I, uh, together with Pierre Jacob, have been arguing for that. Uh, uh, Adaptation for a, what we call the teleological stance, or uh, uh, which is an uh, understanding goal directedness in terms of efficiency of goal approach, where any action that uh, in the most efficient way induces a change of state in the physical world is, is, is uh, the domain. Of, of, of that system. And we also argue, and there is evidence, that that's a more ancient system, so that other non-human animals, uh, species also have that, their rhesus monkeys have that, apes, there are now uh, evidence, and there's wonderful evidence from uh, scary, scary evidence from, uh, this is probably everybody makes this joke, that scary, uh, carry, and spiky, 
uh, are the authors that Siemens holds uh, uh, already show the sensitivity to efficiency of goal approach. However, uh, now, of course, agency cues, or the originally agency cues when the interest first arises pre-MAC was, was self-propelled movement. Then it became important that the variability of move, the possibility to vary uh, your movement is necessary for goal attribution and also a justifiable variation of movement. So if you go around obstacles in an efficient looking way, uh, it's necessary. If there's no obstacle or you go way around, then there's no goal attribution. But this, uh, this is all instrumental agency. And communicative agency, uh, uh, these cues are not sufficient to get these communicative effects. And that is uh, 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 where uh, um, Sue's position was, who, who actually tested this turn taking and, and found that there has to be some social extra cues, like uh, looking in the, uh, at the other, smiling at the other, uh, to, to, to um, interpret that goal directed action as a communicative goal. So, um, uh, what uh, we are arguing that, in fact, changing other people's mind, uh, your choice of words and the uh, Gleisian principles of economy and stuff like that is probably showing efficiency principles in communication to achieve, you don't say more, just say exactly what is necessary for the other to change his mind in the right way. So there, the change of state is in the other's mental representation of the world and not directly of the world. But an efficiency is probably part of that system, but it's not, uh, well, this, this actually would be interesting to apply to, to um, you know, how, how, how good, well-formed Gracian communication where you don't say irrelevant things, you don't say too many things, you say the right, you know, you take into consideration what is needed for the other to, to change his mind. It's, all, it, it's a great skill that uh, Harvard is, goes for a long period of learning, I think. So babies are very good in receiving communication and lousy in producing communication at the beginning, so there is an asymmetry in this system, which is very interesting. But it is a different system, this being the claim that uh, defending. Thanks. I'm a little bit ignorant about the field, so I've got a very naive question. So how can you actually dissociate whether motherese is so effective because that's what children have been exposed to through their development, or whether this is really because of specific features about motherese. I mean, are there some populations, maybe children from blind people or whatever, mm -hmm. that are not so much exposed to motherese and um, thus is modulate the effectiveness? Yeah, this is a very important question. That I can say two things about it. One is that, that uh, preference for infant-directed speech, motherese, is innate. So we know that newborn babies show it. Uh, we also know that newborn babies of parents who cannot talk show it, so they couldn't have heard it in the womb, or uh, minimal, so from the, uh, some other speakers maybe. But, uh, and we know that uh, autistic children do not show a preference for. Now that still leaves the question of the cross-cultural cross question, for example which now stirs some degree of interest and we ourselves are, we, we, we have this uh, um, large EU, EU grant that, that has comparative with apes and, and uh, cross-cultural component in it. So we are planning to go to uh, uh, the Congo Basin to uh, uh, with uh, Barry Hewlett, who is a specialist in the Aka uh, uh, small case uh, scale um, hunter gatherer uh, cooperative breeder society, which allegedly doesn't use mother eaves. We know that even if they are innate, some of these community signals, they can be suppressed by culture. Because there is, for example, pointing, there is a culture where you point with your 
uh, with your mind. I cannot do it, I'm sorry, but you know, but they actually uh, can adapt and they really can, like nearly a finger long uh, uh, kind of kiss like uh, gesture they can do. But those children start to point. And it's just not polite, and, and they're punished for doing that, so soon they learn. So it's not impossible, I don't know whether, but there are claims, but there are all sorts of uh, claims not necessarily well founded in the uh, cross-cultural literature, but that would be an interest. So I would love that because we have some evidence where the only cue is mother is, and we can show that uh, that can induce an interpretation of the referent as a token of a referent kind about which you learn like a, 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 a novel functional thing that we make these little functional, you know, you manipulate and it makes light or something. And, and so they, they uh, 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 show kind-based individuation in the shoe and carry paradigm uh, uh, if mother is, was but, but you don't need to name those, so it's, it's like oh, those objects only address the child in Mother Eve before he sees those objects. Now, if I could take that paradigm down to the Akas, who, where I would make sure they really don't use Mother Eve, or to very little, I mean, you can go like gradation, and uh, the prediction would be that if this is an adaptation, and we also argue in other that this is an adaptation to transmit in a very fast way cultural and opaque knowledge that, that inductively, with inductive generalizations, would just take very long and very hard to learn. So that's the, our just, the just so story that we put behind this. So, so that would be, that's an open an area where there is a lot of interest now to uh, look at uh, whether the, uh, whether these adaptations for communicative transmission on face, basically, of novel information is, is a, a human cultural adaptation or not. I have a young student over here. I can't make out the badge. I think it says Alf or Alphonse. There. <laughs> Uh, very ingenious experiments. Um, I was struck by the experiment where um, uh, the, the flat fish are either repeating um, the sequence or they're not, and uh, it seems to have an effect on the infant's behavior. Where did the infant get that knowledge from that communication requires different kinds of sound sequences. Uh, what are you assuming about how this ability comes about? Well, I tend to assume that this is an evolved capacity. As we are, we, we know there's evidence that for speech we are prepared, evolutionally speaking, and, and we recognize speech sounds and unfamiliar words are sufficient to trigger these inferences, even when you don't know the meaning of the words. But you assume that they have a coded meaning and that must have transmitted uh, information about the other's preference that this person didn't know. But the other said, Koba, Koba must have said, this is what I prefer, give that to me. And they expect that to be given to them. So just as there is at least this particular domain of speech and, and language where uh, it, uh, it's no news for the child probably that, that signals map onto cause. They just have to identify the mapping. Uh, in the same way, they may know something about information theory in a sense that, uh, okay. uh, that uh, variability of uh, of code like signals is necessary to encode uh, 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 proposition information uh, uh, of, of, of a variety of sort. And uh, as maybe Sandra will talk about, I don't know, but she has done 
uh, very uh, similar kind of uh, studies where beeping was introduced in the turn taking but where with humans and one of them was speaking so uh, there are several cues there but after such an exchange those beep sounds changed their power as uh, in categorization tasks Be just beeps are not sufficient to categorize objects in, uh, uh, by feature into categories but uh, after that they are and also the, the statistical learning about the sequential uh, uh, conditional probabilities become um, boosted or available for these signals after they have been experienced in a turn-taking fashion which suggests that these signals start to be treated like potential words or, co or codes. Well, I, I think there's a big difference between saying that you've adapted to pay attention to certain kinds of cues and to say that you uh, then transform those kinds of cues into information. Now the question is whether you need to have had some kind of experience to, um, to be able to actually extend from paying attention to sounds uh, to extracting information. And I was trying to understand what exactly your claim is. Mm -hmm. Are you claiming that okay. we've evolved to already notice the difference as communication versus experience in the context of being cued to sounds leads to the interpretation as information? Mm -hmm. Those are very different theories. Okay, so let me, I like your question, so let me backtrack just a little bit and say that, uh, that uh, this cue, it be 13 months old, the turn taking, it in fact could have been learned because they have, th th this just an abstract pattern of in co turn taking interactions that highly co varies with communicative interactions where there is the information transfer. So by 13 months, the infant may have had enough experience to extract that. And uh, uh, so I am, I would buy that. Uh, and they are not cues in the, or signals in the sense like, like mother is or, or, or looking in the eye can, which is just like a, a code. It just codes communicative intention. And this has to unfold in the interactive sequence. So, May, it may have been extracted that way, but by 30 months it seems to be that. So I buy every word you said today, except for <laughs> um, uh, something that you threw away. Um, you several times say that what the baby expects is being transmitted is propositional information. And the, 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 it's certainly they expect information to be transmitted, but you don't have the goods that it's, prop, that it, that it's, it's propositional. So in the case where the baby expects um, two objects behind there, it's a different guy. You could say, he expects it's a different guy. He expects there are two objects. You're encoding it propositionally, but as you know from Dora's beautiful work, um, um, the content of what's being expect, expected in that case um, piggybacks on the working memory object file representations, which are not propositional in either format or content. Um, so, okay. so I'm not saying it no, no. is, but but we don't know what the form of representation of what's being attributed to the other, um, to the, yeah. as, as yeah. uh, what it, the information that's being encoded. And certainly that, that the name of. So, so I'm glad I'm also connecting to your upcoming talk uh, with this. Uh, uh, well, let, let me uh, qualify. So the statement was, uh, I, I was trying to, and uh, uh, the, the more curious data I didn't, didn't present is kind of requiring this thinking. I was trying to make um, a distinction between two levels or strong or weak ostensive communication. So uh, 
turn taking at a distance implies attention to the other, implies coordination, temporal coordination, uh, and, uh, and could transmit type of fixed information like, uh, you know, like uh, in the mating season, oh, choose me, or, or, uh, or uh, um, give me food, and uh, uh, so, but, but, uh, the, so they are changing the dispositional state of the other. However, to transmit, uh, uh, so I wonder about the level of description of the ball that was in A by, uh, is now in box B. I suppose it, it is a question of how, uh, um, you know, for example, Pierre Jacob is arguing that if you put a, a ball in a container which moves in the Piagetian invisible displacement task, then to represent that has to be propositional because the object is... So, so it, it is an argument and it is a very important argument for, for our um, understanding of where and what, what kind of representations uh, and when they come on and uh, propositional representations are. But I really wanted to make the point about the variability that, that uh, if you want to transmit proposition information, you need variability of the code, the code system, so unpredictability. Yeah. So I, I agree with that, um, but, but what you have evidence for is that the baby takes variability as evidence for transmittal of information, right? So, so I agree of that... relevant that information. It, yeah. yeah, relevant information. But, so they, they know that they should update the model that they attribute, it, that they attribute to yes. the seer. But that model might not be rep in representational in format or content. However, it has to be inferentially derived from the fact that communication has taken place. So it's communication induced belief representation. Whether it's propositional or not, yeah. I agree. I would love to know. I was wondering about the contingency learning. So over, over development, how does it work that, I, I think like the contingency could be like, you could change the temporal integration window, right? And also the conditional probabilities and both. I mean, if you, if you for instance, medium, make the conditional probabilities smaller and smaller, then of course you need to average over more trials in order to find out that actually there is some contingency, right? And the same thing is like, what is the, on, what is the difference in timing of the onset of when one does something and the other, the next person? So I would assume that both of these things increase with development, but I was just wondering how does it work? You mean the, the degree of contingent yeah, dependency so, so if, within if, the If person exchange. A does something, then yeah. person well, B does something. I mean, we know from, from a lot of work from, from uh, since John Watson, contingency detection that infants are highly, highly sensitive to, to identify different degrees of contingent uh, dependencies. So, and six months old babies with uh, relatively uh, low responsive mothers develop a habitual level of contingency and prefer that even for the higher level contingency. So it's, it's uh, 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 the mechanism uh, seems to be there to differentiate between different levels of contingent dependencies. Also, I mean, these are very, very high in normal, sometimes the other doesn't say something or, so, so it, it, you can degrade this in many different ways. However, we have varied the degree of of, of variability uh, in our mm, non-echoing uh, variable, and and we got the same results. So it, it uh, which was not exactly what was our first, you know, and we were thinking along more along the line that uh, you suggested that either the, the amount or a certain type of linguistic-like 
uh, 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 serial dependency structure may be what's driving the communicative attribution. But what we found is that as long as there is variability, and it can be totally variable, so the C uh, sounds are totally variable, uh, but temporary contingent, you get the same result. So, so um, it's, it's, uh, it rather what it suggests is that if there is no variability, that blocks uh, the inference that a particular content has been transmitted uh, that is relevant to the other. Yeah. Okay, we're, uh, we're running a little bit late. Um, it's time for coffee and the poster session. Let's everybody get back here by 11.20 at the latest for Sandra Waxman's talk. And then let's thank George for a beautiful, beautiful talk.